Hello, Finimizers. Welcome to another Finimize live event. My name is Stefan. I'm your Finimize analyst and a host of today's event called Five Shears for your ISA, How Our Grapes Lansdowne Conducts Research. Uh, first, just a little bit of uh, housekeeping uh, to, to run through. Number one, as you're coming in, please fill out the poll. I think it should be appearing very soon. Uh, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, you know, tell us where you're tuning in from. Uh, and remember to switch to all attendees so that everyone can see your messages. So the format for today will be, as always, 15 minutes uh, conversation uh, with, with Sophie and then followed by a 15 minute audience uh, Q&A. So, you know, make sure to ask all of your questions in the uh, Q&A box. And uh, if you see a question that you like, just, you know, upvote it so that it moves to the top so that we can get through the, the most upvoted questions first. Hi, from Portugal, I see it. Yeah, please everyone, you can, you can, I'm, I'm in Spain. I mean, I'm in the south of Spain in, in Malaga. Um, okay, so let's kick this off. Um, our event partner for today is Hargraves Lansdown, UK's number one platform for, for private investors. And whether you're just starting out or you're an experienced investor, Hargraves has a range of accounts and content to give you the tools and knowledge to invest with confidence. And today, I'm very excited to have our Graves Lansdowne's lead equity analyst, Sophie Lund Yates, with us. So, Sophie, uh, just to give a bit of, of background, is lead equity analyst on HL's share research team. She provides research and regular articles on the selection of individual companies and wider sectors. Sophie's specialties are retail, fast moving consumer goods, aerospace, and defense, as well as a few of the big tech names, including Facebook and Apple. So, first things first, how are you doing, Sophie, today? Hi, I'm good, thank you. Very excited to, to be here. Awesome, great to have you here with us. So lots of exciting things to, to discuss. So let's just let's just dive straight in Finimizers. So maybe Sophie, just, uh, you know, in maybe, you know, two or three minutes, can you just explain a little bit sort of your, your research process? You know, how do you go about identifying great potential investment ideas? Yeah, sure. This is obviously um, a particular challenge at the moment. There's so much noise going on, um, both in the markets and in the economy. Um, and really what myself and my team have, have really doubled down on at the moment is looking at high quality companies. And by that, I mean um, companies that are financially viable. You know, we need to be seeing strong free cash flow generation. So, you know, that's that's what you have left over um, after you've you've invested in keeping you know expansion plans going it's not just about keeping the lights on things like that so free cash flow generation um, we need proof of um, profit as well at least five years of that um, so they're the big the big ones as well not overly leveraged um, and then at the moment as well what we'll do for campaigns like this five shares for an, for an ISA that I'm going to be talking about um, today you know we do a really broad kind of horizon scan you know what is going on what do we think are the biggest threats so shockingly at the moment that's inflation largely um as well as some other some other bits and bobs but we'll do kind of a wider horizon scan look at the biggest threats and then work out um what we think the best defenses are against those against those threats and which companies hopefully have the best defenses against it awesome a very short and punchy answer i like it i like it a lot and i'm sure our minimizers do it too so look, let's let's just dive in. I think you've got basically five stocks uh, that you know you think should be on investors' radar right now. Do you want to maybe just like you know walk us through the five stocks and then maybe do a deep dive on one or two of them? Yeah, sure. So. Um... I mean, what I should start off by saying as well is that I'll be covering, uh, I'm going to I have a bit of a, a presentation here, so I'll be going through um, three of the stocks, hopefully, if, if time allows, I'll keep an eye on that. Um, and also what I do need to say, just a bit of housekeeping as well, is that this nothing that I say today is personal advice or a recommendation to buy, sell or hold any investment. Um, do keep in mind that you know, investing in individual companies is higher risk because you are depending on the fortune of, of one company only. So if that investment fails, you know, you can lose, um, you can lose all of your money. And if you're ever sure if an investment um, is, is not right for you, then please do um, seek um, some advice. So with that, shall I, shall I carry on with the, with the wider presentation with some macro points too, and then d dive into some share ideas? Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. So, just very briefly, as I've been talking about, we'll look at some macro pointers, um, three of our five shares to watch that I'm going to go through the, the other two, and we can talk about later on if, if there's time, um, or they, they are on our website as well. Um, so three shares for an ISA. Um, 
before we kind of look into what these are, of course, there is some huge economic and market trends to keep in mind at the moment. I mean, there's so much, you know, that the news is, is, is full of it at the moment. Um, now, ignoring, I know it's hard to ignore, but ignoring the banking turmoil that we've seen in recent days, because so, a lot of that is, um, it is noise. We know that the European banking sector is, is actually in a much stronger position than perhaps share prices are reflecting at the moment. Um, when we kind of strip that away, and let's get back to what we were talking about just a week ago, and that is the fact that a moderate recession is what's expected to come through for us. Um, so we're not going to be seeing, we don't think, a huge slowdown um, economically. A, a large reason for that um, is because there wasn't enough of a boom to precede it. So we haven't had a big, we're not going to do boom to bust because there hasn't been a big enough boom. Um, now, what does all of this mean? We have, you know, big interest rate decisions coming through this week as well. That's going to see the market have some moves in the short term. Um, but there's essentially so much uncertainty. There are so many unknowns. And what on earth do you do in that environment um, when you're trying to, trying to choose stocks successfully? So one of the main things that you can do is look at companies that generate more reliable revenue streams. So there's a few things that can fall into this category, but one of the biggest is going to be companies that offer essential services. And the more you think about this, the more you can think of. And there are a couple of examples that I'll be going through in a minute. But these are things that either individuals, companies or corporations can't live without. It gives you a little bit more reliability. Um, you should never, ever ignore balance sheets. And I know that sounds boring and people have probably said that to you before, um, but it's really important at the moment. OK, so recessions or downturns or slumps don't kill companies, debt does. So really keep an eye on that as well. Um, I think just another really interesting point at the moment is that Europe and the UK have below average um, valuations. So a lot of that is coming from the weakness um, in the banking stocks. It's kind of spread to these regions, um, or share prices, I should say, rather than weaknesses in the actual stocks themselves. Um, now, I think that's pretty compelling. Obviously, we know that um, the UK and Europe have um, a kind of got a, a large exposure to financial, so that's partly why. Um, but this dynamic was happening before um, the Credit Suisse um, situation. Um, so I just think that's an interesting thing to keep in mind. Looking over to the US, um, at the end of Q4, we saw some cracks in cloud computing coming through. Now, I'm not saying things in cloud computing are falling off a cliff, um, but it is slowing down. And this does have implications for a lot of big tech. So that's just really kind of the headline main things to be thinking about at the moment. Now, with all of this going on, swirling around, and the fact that you look at the scale of the investable universe, you know, there are over 58,000 publicly listed companies um, in the world. Um, it can feel very overwhelming in terms of how on earth you go about choosing stocks successfully. And, and like I said earlier, it's really important to be looking at companies with strong financials um, because it helps reduce, reduce risk, but it's that specialization as well is really, really important. And that's a recurring theme for us. Um, so with that in mind, um, I will have a look at three of our five shares to watch. Um, now, the first one is Caterpillar. So Caterpillar is in the world of heavy duty equipment. So think big machines to help build infrastructure, um, large scale mining equipment. And then there's also energy needs. So things like engines and solar panel units as well. Now, one of the things that's really great about Caterpillar is its scale and expertise. There simply aren't many companies that can offer what what they can. It's really highly specialized. That means it's very hard for competitors to come in and start playing about with their market share. So as an idea of size, I mean, you know, look at that, that figure there, annual revenue is around $59 billion. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind as well is that as much as there are benefits to all business areas, it's um, infrastructure that's really interesting. And a big reason for that is a core core customer um, is, is government, particularly the US government. And that is a high caliber customer to have. Um, and also there are growth opportunities when you consider that China is reopening um, and what this could mean for industrial style demand as well. Now, when you're highly specialized and you're offering an essential service, that feeds into your ability to pay a dividend. You can see here with, with the exception of 2022, um, and please bear in mind those green bars are um, 
our estimates as well. Um, you know, the dividend track record here it looks, you know, really quite quite promising. Um, as always, please keep in mind that, that no dividend is ever guaranteed. Um, so yeah, Caterpillar, I think really um, really quite exciting um, prospects there. Plus, they've just got a lot of really cool trucks, um, which I happen to happen to admire as well. So, secondly, um, at three of the um, second of the third of the five that I'll be looking at today is ASML, which is Netherlands based. Now, I mean, we we always say that it's a good idea to invest with the long term in mind, um, and that's especially true when looking at an ISA, um, looking at ISA investing. Um, now, ASML, as I said, is Netherlands based. It's a market leader in lithography machines, which sounds like horrible jargon, um, but it's machines used to make every type of semiconductor chip. So without these, you wouldn't have the chips that power the latest phones, computers or, or cars. Um, now, what's interesting about ASML is it's not it's, it's in the middle of the chain rather than at the end of a manufacturing chain. So it's a key supplier, it's a key component in the chip business rather than being reliant on what's going on in the semiconductor space um, on its own. We know that the semiconductor markets had a lot of ups and downs recently, um, but ASML is more kind of in the middle of that chain as a key supplier, which we think is more attractive. Um, and again, it comes down to this idea of very, very high levels of specialization, um, really high barriers to entry. The, the research and development spend, the research itself took decades to get these machines where they were and just phenomenally expensive as well. So the gap that competitors have got to kind of traverse in order to, to reach ASML and compete is, is huge and that's really attractive. Um, the other thing I would keep in mind um, is that ASML has a, has a, a sales backlog of well over 40 billion euros um, and a sales backlog there, you know, this isn't the only company with a sales backlog, but as a, as an asset, we think it's really, really interesting and valuable to have that because it means you can, despite uncertainty going on, you can open the book and you can say, look, this business is happening. There's visibility, um, which is really, really attractive um, at the moment. Um, this graph here, the operating profit, um, it just shows you the benefits of scale, essentially, that ASML has managed to create. So you can see in the early days, um, costs were very high. Um, and you know, they're even loss making at times throughout that. Um, but actually, as they've built scale, those operating profits have, have obviously um, moved in a certain direction. Um, please remember that past performance is not a guide to the future. Now, um, third and final one for today um, will be good news for any luxury fans out there. So LVMH, um, a lot of you will have heard of LVMH. It's, it's a phenomenally massive company. Um, it's the result of a merger between Louis Vuitton and Moet Hennessy in 1987. Um, and there are over 70 luxury brands within the portfolio, some of which you can see on the screen here, the obvious one, Louis Vuitton. Um, but there's Dior, Tiffany, Bulgari, Celine, Sephora, absolutely loads. Um, and there are a few things to keep in mind here. Um, which is that um, luxury customers are simply more resilient. You know, they, they aren't affected by economic ups and downs. Um, you know, a cost of living crisis um, doesn't really hit the same way for, for these clients. Um, and being able to charge higher price points feeds directly into um, more comfortable operating margins. You know, they are in the, um, in the high 20s, um, which is obviously um, really quite comfortable. Um, and also, and when we're looking at kind of uh, growth opportunities as well, China reopening is very important. Um, and the reason for that um, is because it's not just more people spending within China, but it's also Chinese customers who who travel and then spend in Europe. And that's a really significant part of the business as well. Um, so in terms of risks, um, and this goes for all three of the stocks that I've, that I've spoken about today, um, particularly um, Caterpillar as well, Caterpillar LVMH, um, sorry, Caterpillar um, and ASML, you know, they would be exposed to a 
to a sharp economic downturn um, that will affect them. So keep that risk in mind. Um, also, with the all three stocks that I've talked about today, LVMH certainly no exception to this. Something that really needs to be considered is the valuation. Um, you know, value is very different to price. And when we look at the valuations of these um, of these stocks, they certainly aren't in value territory. Um, and while that can be a mark of, of confidence from the market, it does increase the risks of ups and downs um, as well. So just do keep that in mind. You know, no investment is, is risk free and it's important to understand some of the specific um, risk drivers as well. And just while I'm on the topic, sorry to um, to, to hop back and forth, but something just to keep in mind, just because it's interesting as well for ASML, um, those machines I was talking about that they specialize in, um, they have up to 100,000 different parts in one of those machines that they're making. So that is just phenomenal, it gives you an idea of that of that scale and complexity I was talking about, but it also can increase risk um, because if you if you know if they struggle to, to source just one of those items, um, then you can lead into production delays as well, which would obviously um, cause probably some some short term wobbles in the share price. Um, I appreciate this is a whistle stop tour, so we can always dig into this um, later on. Um, but just before I do sign off, you know the reason I'm talking today about investing um, in your ISA is because the the tax year end is approaching, as a lot of you will know um, and if you don't use up your your tax-free allowance um, and put it in a, um, put it in that in that kind of tax tax efficient wrapper um, before the end of the tax year then um, you miss out on that on that allowance so three reasons really I would say to invest in a stocks and shares ISA for those of you that, that don't already um, or who are on the fence there's no tax to pay on UK income no capital gains tax um, and it's a tax return time saver essentially as well so anything within the stocks and shares ISA doesn't need to be included on a tax return um, so there's some QR codes there if, if you want to kind of screenshot and, and save this for later. That's not a problem at all. Um, and I will leave these um, important investment notes up as well for you to have a read through, please. Um, and other than that, thank you for, for listening to that whistle stop, whistle stop tour. Thanks a lot, Sophie. Um, okay, so now we have time for, uh, for, the, for the questions. So let me uh, open the, most, the questions with the most upvote. So the first one is which metrics in the balance sheet should be evaluated or assessed? Yeah, it's a great, um, great question. Hopefully I'm not sharing anymore. That's successful. Um, so there are a couple of things you can you can look at there. You know, I could I could do um, a whole whole hour on the balance sheet, but I think I'd, I'd lose most of you because a lot of you probably wouldn't find it as interesting as I do. But the most important thing to consider would be your net debt figure. Now, there are a few ways that you can calculate this. Um, a lot of companies also will give you a net debt or a, rather a net cash position in their, in their own commentary and um, somewhere in their results. Um, but it's always helpful to actually look at it yourself because sometimes management teams, you know, they are going to um, adjust this away or do this, do that. Look at the balance sheet yourself. So what you really want to look at is... Um, current assets so that's your cash um and in particularly for i would say your large cap us companies you want to look at cash equivalents so that's marketable securities that can be easily turned into cash um, and then from that figure that you have you want to deduct um liabilities as well um i would look at that with your long term and short term there are lots of different types of debt that are listed there but the one that you want to look at for this figure um is something uh, something it'll be it'll be called something like um, bank borrowings or current liabilities. It'll be something like that on there. Um, and you want to compare that net debt figure or net cash if they do in fact have more cash than they do liabilities. Um, you want to compare that to, to earnings um, and have a look um, at your actual leverage level. You know, there's no hard and fast rule in terms of what leverage levels you would call dangerous because it varies massively sector, sector to sector. Um, but if anything is at or approaching or over two, not saying that's game over, but that it's at that point you want to start, you just want to start having a look and asking, asking why. Thanks, that was a great question and a great answer. So next, uh, when searching for companies, how do you start narrowing them down before doing all of the balance sheet checks, et cetera? Great question. 
yeah, it's a really great question. Um, it's certainly a tough, a tough ask with um, the number of companies that are out there. Um, lots of people do it differently. Uh, the way that my team do it and the way that I would um, suggest um, is, like I said, so if you do do a sweep, do a scan, you know, what, what's going on at the moment in the world, um, things like interest rates are rising. So we've, you know, looked at that before. If you say, for example, what kind of company might benefit from a higher interest rate environment? Um, and you would have a look at those sectors, you know, maybe maybe banks um, might be might be a way to to look at a, to look at that. Obviously, not too far because if interest rates are too high, um, then you have uh, you hit recession, and then banks suffer in a recession, all that kind of stuff. But you'd look at something thematic like that, um, or if you say, right, okay, I think that even if the economy doesn't uh, go into reverse this year, you know, we think best case scenario is it's probably going to stagnate, or we might have a moderate recession. So, okay, what companies are going a better placed to to do well in times of economic difficulty you know that's not your companies that are relying on people spending on a discretionary basis it's people that are going to be um it's going to be supplying essential or non-negotiable or luxury goods in, in our opinion so work backwards from that so have a look at the scan the horizon what are the biggest threats and opportunities coming through which companies therefore um could be placed to sort that out and then you want to look at the financials and, and whittle it down further great questions next one you mentioned that asml are in the early slash middle stage of the supply chain in the semiconductor sector what are the main factors that keep it from being affected by the challenges of the semiconductor market yeah sure it's a great question so it's like when you think of any major supply chain you know if you if you are the end game you're the person selling that thing um and you might see demand fluctuate or there's um there's issues with um you know we saw the manufacturing processes in in, in china that were, were quite quite challenging um by being the middle of that chain particularly these very specialized machines um they are the demand simply is not affected in the same way. And the reason for that is that people need what they are selling. They need they need it. So they know that as and when things loosen up um, and that demand comes back through again, they can't have been on the back foot and not place those orders. Um, so that kind of helps to, to smooth things out. Thanks. Another question from AK. What's the best way to check if a company is ESG compliant, if not immediately obvious? Yeah, sure. And um, it's obviously of growing importance um, to, to, to clients and investors more generally, and, 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 and rightly so. Um, there's a couple of, of ways you can, you can do that. Um, companies are, by and large, now a lot more transparent i'm not saying everybody's perfect but they are a lot more transparent at what they are doing on an esg basis and how they're scoring against certain frameworks as well so i'd say always always have a look at their um, annual report or a lot of them should you know they'll have a sustainability report and read that with a fine tooth comb and um, feel free to read it with a with a cynical hat on and actually dig into what they're saying and what they're doing you know if they said they were going to deliver something 10 years ago or five years ago probably more realistic um how are they actually tracking on that are they still talking about it are they being granular are they giving you the information that you want um, and then there is also other access to to things if you'd like it um things like sustainalytics um, as well um, is a really, really excellent data provider on, on that um, side of things as well. But you know, half the problem with, with ESG, um, it's getting a lot better. Um, we know that the data is quite, is quite fragmented and there's a lot of, there's a lot of voices in the room. Um, so I think a, a, a big step that you can take is reading that sustainability um, report yourself and then, you know, make your own opinion on what you think if they're, if they're doing what they said they were going to do. Thanks, Sophie. <clears throat> Thanks for the presentation, very useful. Why is ASML forecast to have consistent high year on year operating profit growth from 2023 to 2025? Sorry, the line went a bit dodgy then. Could you repeat that for me? So essentially, why is ASML forecasted to have consistent higher, 
high, consistently high year-on-year -year operating profit growth from 2023 to 2025. Yeah, sure. Um, so first things first, um, it's really important to keep in mind that they are estimates. So you know, we don't we don't know for sure that that's going to happen. Uh, you know, that, that was data compiled by um, Refinitiv Icon for anyone um, for anyone interested. Um, I think a big reason for it is. Um, that notion of operating leverage that I was talking about. Um, so the benefits of the benefits of scale. So now that they have built the infrastructure um, that was very, very expensive to set up, essentially each new um, good that you put through that, that's that network, that manufacturing process, um, a lot more of it can drop through to profit because your per unit cost of using that infrastructure when more of it is rattling through um, reduces. Um, and obviously there are um, indications that suggestions that actually that the chip market as well demand is going to be is going to be even stronger than it has been for them. Um, so as these things pick up, you know, we see China reopening, all of that um, helpful stuff um, as well is going to feed into to that side of things too. Awesome, thanks. How will current interest rates affect EPS for each of the companies mentioned in this webinar? <laughs> Great question. Um, so obviously it's going to depend a lot on what those interest rates are. Um, it's really, it's very interesting because when you talk about ASML, for example, and you think, right, okay, it's a more growthy stock and that's actually what's, what's fallen out of favor um, recently, but actually on an interesting basis you know we're seeing treasury yields um fall um and at, the, at that point we've seen a little bit in recent days i don't know if this is going to continue but it's definitely worth monitoring what that's actually done is um encourage investors towards growth stocks again um in recent days um because they're seeking income elsewhere so i think that's a potentially interesting development certainly not a guaranteed one but but interesting um who else have i talked about so lvmh as well the higher interest rates um really have um a, quite a limited impact on on LVMH. Um, as I was saying, that you're worried about interest rates taking too much heat out of the um, out of the economy, which will hurt consumer bases. Um, but the truth is that really LVMH's core customer base um, aren't that affected um, by that. What I would say is LVMH does have quite a sizable debt pile, so it would be making sure to keep an eye on how much of their debt is uh, linked to higher interest rates as well and just keeping an eye on whether those repayments seem um, seem manageable you know they're very very cash generative so it's certainly not something that's sounding an alarm but you just be wanting to see just to just to triple check um that the that the the debt is is serviceable okay hey, i think we have time for maybe one or two more I'll be for quick. companies with stable revenue streams, will growth of free cash flows be low? Is this a concern? Sorry, can you say that again? I'm so sorry. No, no, sorry. Uh, so for companies with stable revenue streams, will growth of free cash flows be low? Is this a concern? Um, no, I don't. So what is, is free cash flow going to remain um, low because they have sustainable or more reliable revenue streams? Is that the question? I don't know, Sahil, do you want maybe to, to elaborate your, your, your answer? Maybe we can go with Mark's question while you, you elaborate your answer and, uh, and, uh, and we go back to you. So then Mark is asking, what indicators would you look for to buy a share? Um, what indicators would I look for? Um, again, this is very much dependent on your own risk appetite. So for me, I'm, I have kind of a medium risk appetite. So I want to, I want that evidence of financial strength, um, and especially free cash flow, is so important. Uh, but I also want to see a little bit of growth opportunity. I don't mind a company, um, you know, maybe doing something a little bit more risky, say uh, mergers and acquisitions growing quite aggressively. Um, but most importantly, and I know it's not the most fun thing, um, but I want a company that has actually got the financial frameworks in place that means it can weather ups and downs. Because for me personally, that's where my, my risk appetite sits. And it doesn't mean that you have to give up growth. It just means that growth comes in drips and drabs and you let compounding do the work um, over time rather than trying to find something that's going to shoot for the moon and, and you've, you're a much higher chance of volatility. 
Okay, and the last question, because uh, I haven't heard any follow-up from, from Sahil, but Tom is asking a question that I, I, I actually I, I would have thought that would be one of the first ones to be asked, which is when investing in a new company, how do you determine how much cash should you should allocate? What is a good entry strategy? Uh, as in your, your own personal money, how much you should spend? I think here it's it's also kind of how would you allocate amongst the different the different ideas and and you oh know. I see what you mean right okay yes so diversification really really important so you're absolutely right to be bringing up this idea that you should be spreading your cash into different into different areas that's so important um, whether that's different product areas or different geographies whatever uh, it might be different asset types um, again it comes down to what your ultimate goal is you know looking at these are, do you want something that's maybe a little bit riskier um but you don't mind you don't mind having a bit more of an up and down journey um then you'd allocate more of your cash that way and i think it's just really important to, to understand the difference between something that's trying to be like a high octane growth and something that might be a bit steadier um, and then look at what your look at what your goals are ultimately um, and your time horizon that would be the most important thing to consider when um when allocating your, your cash as well as your risk profile. And in terms of entries, do you look for a particular setup, you know, by on strengths, by on weaknesses, like dollar cost average, any anything on entries? Yeah, sure. I mean, really, um, it's pretty old school. The main the main thing that we would we will look at really is the valuation profiles. We, we're not going to suggest anything that we think it might not be it might not be the cheapest or it might not be um, the weakest evaluation has ever been. Um, but I think trying to understand when something um, genuinely has has room for that accretion, room for that room for that growth and isn't um, isn't overly frothy uh, is so important because as, as that famous saying, you know, price is, is what you pay and value is, is what you get. You wouldn't pay any price whatsoever for a car, no matter how much you wanted it and how much you loved it, because you know what it's worth. And it's just it's it's, it's keeping that in mind always. Thanks. And we always finish on time, but this time we also don't want to disappoint Sahil. We just came up with the with the rephrasing of the question. So okay. We, mega super quick. So basically his question is if a firm has a stable, you know, matured revenue stream, hence uh, the growth of its free cash flows or low, is that potentially a concern? Low oh, growth right, okay. cash flows. Um, no, no, not necessarily. I mean, it can be certainly, um, but those two things aren't aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, you know, if you have the right um, infrastructure in place and the model is attractive, then actually stable revenue should should keep free cash flow healthy for for as long as revenues are healthy. Um, and obviously within that, just very quickly, obviously making sure that within that, uh, the capital expenditure is also being done sensibly, because if, if you under invest in capital expenditure, then one day you might have to, to massively over invest, which can which can hurt free cash flow as and when that happens um, but overall no those things don't necessarily mean one is going to, to cause the other amazing thanks a lot sophie that was very actionable very very to the point very sweet so thanks thanks a lot for this uh, hopefully for all me. our finimizers have uh, have enjoyed it uh, too please fill out the feedback form that will pop up after this event finish and we will see you at the next event thanks again sophie thanks a lot for Thank your time you. take care bye. everyone bye bye